The title of the talk is Economics of Volunteer Labor, Three Stories from Debian. And uh, I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to try to convince you is that there are these three important takeaways you need to know about how economics affects volunteers in your open source community. And I'm talking about purely volunteer labor. I'm not talking about the complexities of mixing paid labor and volunteer labor, although that's a fascinating topic. Uh, the three takeaways I want you to leave with are the distinction between collaboration and cooperation, which I'll discuss in the first story. Uh, I'll talk about how Debian developers aren't really altruists, and if you think we are, then you're going to make the wrong conclusions. And uh, I'm going to tell you how to set direction in your own open source community by changing what's easy for, bless you, for the other community members to do. So uh, the structure of this talk is I will give you a little bit of background on Debian first, and then on a quick refresher on economics. And then we'll talk about three stories in Debian that will get pretty technical, but I should hopefully explain all the technical details so that you'll see, I think, the economic reasons why these projects did and didn't succeed. So uh, with that said, let me tell you a little bit about Debian. Uh, so Debian is the basis of Ubuntu. How many people here run Debian or Ubuntu on a computer of theirs? Very nice. Uh, and uh, are you squinting at me, Bradley? Do you not like Debian? I said it's great that we all run Debian or Ubuntu. Anyway, I thought you were squinting at me. Oh, well, so, so I'm putting them together because Debian is the volunteer community that Ubuntu is based on. Um, there are many more volunteer contributors to Debian than there are in Ubuntu, which is kind of fascinating. Um, so OK, uh, can, I get, can I get hands again for people who run Debian or Ubuntu? Yeah. OK, keep your hands up for a moment. Now, uh, put your hand down if you only run Ubuntu and not Debian. So if you are a Debian, if you're a user of pure Debian, keep your hands up. OK, OK, so like a third-ish or something. Cool. Um, and I think it's fascinating that Debian has fewer users and yet more volunteer contributors. Uh, there are about 1,000 a 1, plus contributors to Debian. It's been around since the early 90s. It's been around before the term open source existed. Um, and it's a pure volunteer community. It's not funded by some company like Google funds Angular, Facebook funds React, Ansible funds Ansible, Puppet funds Puppet. There's no Debian company. Uh, there's just people who believe in the importance of making a free software operating system. And yet, uh, together, we, the Debian world, make 56,000 packages that you can install. Uh, a package in Debian is a particular thing that is installable. Um, so like LibreOffice's spreadsheet is a package. Uh, you add up enough of these, and you have an operating system with a lot of choice for users. Um, there's 1,400 people who have contributed to Debian over the past year, according to contributors.debian.org, which tracks this thanks to Enrico Zini. And uh, of those people, 600 of them are people who have uploaded packages. The rest have done other various things, like submit bug reports or comment on bugs. Uh, perform translations, maintain the Debian infrastructure, and there's some overlap too. Uh, but these package uploaders are particularly the people who are making those 56,000 installable packages. Uh, and that's the number of people who have been active this year so far. These people are supported by a document called Debian Policy. Has anyone here spent time reading Debian Policy? Wow, great. OK, so uh, those of you know that is 114 pages long or so. The PDF is that long uh, in letter with like space between some of the pages after the table of contents, so maybe it's really more like 100. But it's this pretty long thing, and we don't just write policy for the fun of it. Uh, we write it to minimize conflict. Uh, having really clear rules about what Debian package maintainers are allowed to do in their packages means that maintainers can act independently. They can work independently without having to ask each other, is what I'm doing going to conflict with what you're doing? So that, I think, is the basics you need to know about Debian. Uh, I'll refresh a little bit about economics now. So this is section two where I talk about economics. And I said there would be a note-taking exercise. Uh, tell me again your name. Sorry, Stephanie? Stephanie. Stephanie, great, yes. Thank you for this pen. Uh, actually, there is no note-taking exercise. I was just trying to demonstrate that people volunteer to do things. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, you have volunteered to do something meaningful, which is to participate in the talk. It was just a different way of volunteering than you expected. Uh, that bit of trickery is not related to economics in the way I'm describing it. That's just a me thing. Um, but the point here is people do volunteer to do things. And uh, 
There are other talks about the motivations of volunteers, about why they choose to do things. Um, there are studies like the Fosspole study from 2001-ish, 2-ish, uh, and there's much more recent work since then. Um, but I'm just going to sort of assume that people have some reasons, that they're getting something out of, vol about, out of volunteering, like uh, maybe there was social pressure because you didn't want to talk to start late, so you wanted me to get that pen. Or maybe you had a positive feeling from me clear, being happy that you gave me a pen. Thank you. I'm really grateful for it. I really am. Um, <laughs> there are other talks about burnout anyway, which is the opposite of motivation. Um, it's a pretty strong negative thing when people find that they are surprised to no longer care about something they used to care about. Uh, I have experienced this, I've called it in people, it's a really negative thing, but what I want to talk about in this talk is the space between motivation and burnout, so this slide is intentionally left blank. It's, it's when people are just sort of doing things, they're successfully contributing to projects, that's the time between initial motivation and burnout. And, you know, people have some reasons for contributing to open source projects, whatever they are, and they might not be expressible as reasons, they might just be deep feelings, I know that I'm doing this because I want you people to think I'm important. And uh, there's a couple of important concepts from economics that can help us understand a little bit more about this. So I'll start with supply. Supply is this question of who will give some good, some product to the world. So uh, if I offer to pay a pen, if I offer to pay people in this room a dollar, uh, some of you might give me a pen. If I offered you $100, hopefully more of you would give me a pen. So there's this general concept that as prices increase, uh, supply increases. And here's an arbitrary graph off Wikipedia illustrating this claim. <laughs> um, so uh, that's supply. Um, demand is this question of who would buy a pen from me if I offered it to you. So if, if I say, give me $100 and I'll give you a pen, a uh, few of you would probably accept that deal unless you really needed that pen right now. If I drop the price to a dollar, some of you might buy it. If you saw a pen in the store for a cent, you'd be like, wow, this is a good deal. I wasn't doing anything else with that cent. I guess I'll get a pen. <laughs> so uh, there's this idea in economics that, these, that you can draw a similar line for demand. And these two can meet at a happy place called uh, the equilibrium price level. So the idea of this graph, anyway, is that if, uh, if this is supply, whoa, anyway. If this is supply, um, like if this is if if pens are at this price, were they to be a little cheaper, people would really want to buy them, but there wouldn't be enough people supplying them at that price, so there would be long lines, but also cheap pens. Uh, and then if you increase the price, there would be pens wasted because uh, at a hundred dollars per pen, lots of people, lots of manufacturers are going to be excited to make pens, but they're not going to find buyers. So uh, this works great for pens because they are what economists call a rival good. Um, to the extent that it works well enough anyway, and we can talk about that afterwards. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is that when I get a pen in the store, it's preventing someone else from buying that very same pen. So this rivalness means that if, something, if I value something, I'm going to pay up to how much it's worth to me to get that thing. Uh, I'm not going to just get it by magic. So I know that I'm going to have to trade some value, be it time or money or something. Um, and this leads us to my favorite sentence in economics, which is this definition of scarcity. People have unlimited wants, but resources are limited. This is like the, um, it sounds like some dystopian future, but it's just a statement of fact. <laughs> uh, it's just a definition of this fact that for rival goods, there is scarcity. Um, but by contrast, in Debian, when these 600 packagers upload a package, if you, they upload, somebody uploads the new version of the LibreOffice spreadsheet, and I install it, I'm not taking that away from anyone. There's no rivalrousness here. So maybe open source lives in a beautiful, joyous world without, uh, without scarcity? And I almost think that, but then I look at this again, and I'm like, I still have unlimited wants. I want my open source software to do things it doesn't do. There's clearly some resource that's limited. So uh, presumably, that's other people's time, maybe my time also. Um, and in economics, there's this other key concept that people face trade-offs. If you are going to do something, it means you're not going to spend that time doing something else. If you're going to buy this pen, it means you're not going to spend that money buying a different thing, like donating to the World Wildlife Federation. So 
when I see this, it just reminds me that people who choose to spend their time contributing to open source projects as volunteers are choosing that over everything else in their life at that moment. They are trading off, going to the store, or poaching eggs for brunch, or doing all sorts of things uh, in order for me to meet my unlimited wants. So I appreciate that. Uh, I know that the people who are volunteering, myself included, uh, in economic terms, think at the margin. So this is a phrase that means when I'm choosing to do something, I know that I choose it based on the consequences of that action. Margin is the economics term in this case for this specific thing, the next thing. So if I spend an hour reviewing a package in Debian, it's because I think that spending that time reviewing a package in Debian is worth it uh, for the results of reviewing that package. So limited time is where our scarcity comes from in open source, I believe. And uh, having said this, I'm going to talk about these three stories in Debian. So the first example is this service called cdn.debian.net. So uh, we, we heard it from a bunch of you who run Ubuntu and Debian. Uh, how many of you know what a mirror is? Who knows what a mirror is? Great. Uh, who's willing to tell me what a mirror is? Great. Uh, you need, a mirror is a copy of a master somewhere, and you generally put them in lots of different places to make them look easier. Yeah. And so in Debian, the main thing that we mirror is all of those 56,000 packages. Um, and uh, like you said, we spray them all over the world. So there might be a mirror near you. One of the fun facts about the internet is that, generally speaking, servers close to you, you can download from faster. So uh, in the Debian installer, we have a default mirror, which is called ftp.debian.org. And we ask you, where in the world are you based? Maybe you want to choose the US mirror, ftp.us.debian.org. Um, if you're based in Belgium, consider ftp.be.debian.org. Uh, there's also this long mirror chooser in the installer where it's like, uh, if you're in the US, uh, consider these. Here's a list of host names. And if you don't know that this last one is in Baltimore, then if you live in the District of Columbia, you might not realize that that one is super speedy for you, so you wouldn't choose it. It's kind of sad that you can't uh, necessarily, that, you know, you might not come to this experience with enough information about the options to choose the best option for you. Um, you might alternatively choose to take time to research those options and then pick the best one for you. So in the installer, historically in Debian, we ask every user to pick their default, their mirror, based on the list. Um, and if we estimate this at about 30 seconds of user time in the installer, and you generously let me claim that about 10 million people install Debian every year, then uh, if we do that math, that's about 10 years of person time that is being spent on choosing a mirror. Um, it's kind of like the Debian installer kills 10 of those people every year <laughs> of the 10 million, because it just replaces their life in aggregate, summed across others with its own desires. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, you know, 10 years, 10 people uh, per year we're killing. Um, you can imagine, I could write an angry tweet about this. How can the Debian installer team keep killing all these people every year? Um, and this, these time sinks do add up. Uh, and if the Debian installer team were to look at this seriously, you know, they would, I think, basically agree with my numbers. And uh, if we believe that the Debian installer team is incentivized somehow to actually care about the users and uh, have their lives be better, which I think they are, then they could decide this is totally bad and they could remove this question. And if they were doing that, as a rational agent facing trade-offs, they would, in effect, uh, be choosing this action over all the other actions. Um, and the thing is that choosing a mirror is actually kind of important. Um, so yeah, it makes the install process half a minute slower, um, this one time when you do the install. But Let's say you, do, you install packages 10 times a year, and if choosing a good mirror saves you about five minutes of download time, then we're talking about five minutes of download time every time you install packages versus half a minute once. Um, if you do this math, if you believe me on these things, then it's about 100 times worse to remove that question from the installer. Removing the question kills 1,000 people. <laughs> so I hope that they would rationally consider this and uh, leave that question in. Um, but we're still talking about wasting, you know, 10 person years 
per year in the Debian installer right now. And not every Debian developer is happy with that. And there are a bunch of, of, other, bunch of other options that the Debian world has tried to try to save the world this time. Uh, the one that I had heard of 10 years ago was a tool called Apt Spy. So this is based on the intuition that a computer could pick the closest mirror for you. Uh, Apt Spy is a program that you can app get install right now, and it will look through the list of mirrors and do some download speed checks and then tell you which one is the fastest. And then you get to edit your Debian system configuration in the sources.list file to point at the new fastest mirror. And so if running this thing takes, downloading and running this thing takes about five minutes, that's about the same as the time you would have saved in a month. Uh, so even though it'll save you time in the long run, you might just be focused on your time right now. And so it's not clearly worth spending those five minutes to run AppSpy. Uh, another thing is that if you move your laptop around, then the answer will change. So it's not clear that doing this is a great plan. Uh, they, then there's this question of, as a Debian developer, what can I do to get people to use AppSpy? Uh, I could write a blog post. Um, some of my better blog posts have 10,000 readers or so. If we assume that every single one of those is someone who really needs this tool and will then go home and use it, I'll be saving, uh, I'll be saving them about an hour over the course of a year so I'll be saving about 10,000 person hours. But that's pocket change compared to 10 million hours that we were talking about before. So writing a blog post isn't really a very good way to achieve this goal. Uh, so that's way one to improve the mirror situation. Way two is this project called cdn.debian.net. So this is based on the concept that if users only have to edit their sources.list file once to, lay, to name, to choose this mirror for the Debian packages, then this system, this host here, can choose the best mirror for them in real time, and so they won't have to reconfigure when they move their laptops around. Uh, in 2010, some Japanese Debian developers created cdn.debian.net, um, and it's based on this fascinating strategy where, depending on where you are on the internet, when you look up this name to, in order to get an IP address, the system will give you a different IP address based on where you are. So that is worth expounding on. Uh, first of all, in the internet in general, as you might know, all internet communication fundamentally occurs between IP addresses, not between names. So if you type google.com in your browser, you have to find the numeric IP address behind the scenes of Google. So you can send Google the message that you want their web page, and then they'll send you back the web page. Uh, in, in the late 90s, Akamai invented this content delivery network thing, which is now pretty popular based on this idea that you could kind of guess based on where on the internet the IP address lookup was coming from, what IP address to give. Uh, and this basically works pretty well. So it does mean that if you go to Australia and your host is set, your sources list is set to cdn.debian.net, your system will end up using the Australian mirror uh, because this system can in fact figure out where in the world you are. It's kind of coarse grained, but it's good enough. Um, there's a difficulty with this, though, which is that it relies on HTTP name-based virtual hosts, which is to say the following. How many of you have configured Apache or Nginx to serve more than one website? Yeah, a bunch of you. Cool. So, uh, or Lighty or whatever's your favorite server. Uh, you know, then, that you have to state the name of the each, each in separate website that you run, you have to say the names that it can be reached at in the config file in your web server. So that means that the cdn.debian.net people have to get the help, the cooperation, of a mirror operator to get them added to the network. So it's not just good enough to map to an IP address. You have, someone has to conf have configured the host at that IP address to believe that it is cdn.debian.net so that it can, when your system asks for a package, know to answer with the package. Uh, it requires the cooperation of the mirrors because of this technical facet that it relies on HTTP name-based virtual hosts. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears for a moment and talk about why if anyone runs a mirror. I only know myself, so I'll tell you why I ran a mirror. In 2004, I was a student at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and I was looking at this long list of Debian mirrors, and I was like, look at all these great colleges in here. Harvey Mudd, MIT, like places all over the world. I could put Hopkins on the map. And like, really, this was my motivation. So it was a point of pride for me for Hopkins, and I spent a few weeks learning how these arsing scripts work, worked. And I like, 
emailed the Debian sysadmin team and discovered there was actually a better collection of mirror scripts that I could use, and so on. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's in the, um, this, this mirror, mirrors.acm.jhg.edu, is still in the list of mirrors, because once I set it up, it basically runs forever. And okay, actually the people at the computer club now have to maintain it all the time. But um, <laughs> whatever, I sign them up for it somehow, because it's in the list. Um, now my motivation was that I wanted faster downloads on campus, and I also wanted to be in this public list with the thing that I had done. Um, and now I don't live in Baltimore, so I don't spend any time maintaining that mirror. Uh, which means that for the cdn.debian.net people, like I'm pretty sure mirrors.acm.jhg.edu never made it in this CDN Debian list. Because there was no one who cared enough about people outside of Baltimore who weren't willing to change their system configuration, who was also a maintainer of this service to configure it so that it would work with less configuration for everyone. Um, the, incentive just, the incentives weren't aligned, is what economists would say. Uh, there was no one who cared about that thing. And like, I could have done it. I'm giving you this talk now. Like, I clearly care somewhat about this, but I didn't go and edit the comp files. Uh, by contrast, there's a different effort in Debian more recently called http.debian.net. So this looks the same as cdn.debian.net to a user. Uh, the way it works is you edit your sources.list, and instead of saying ftp.debian.org, you type this thing in. Uh, it just happens not to play games with DNS. It happens to work via HTTP redirects. So when I do app get update and I have my system pointed at this machine, my computer will ask http.debian.net, hey, what are the most recent packages? And it'll say, I don't know, ask that server. Uh, and that redirect is a normal HTTP redirect with the normal host name of that server. So that server doesn't have to be in on the joke. <laughs> no one there has to opt into configuration here. Uh, and so this began very, relatively recently, I think a year and a half ago. By contrast, cdn.debian.net is a five-year-old project. Um, this only really was possible because around five years ago, apt-get started supporting <laughs> redirects. Up until then, if you had a server that gave you a redirect, it would say, error 301. <laughs> and this is pretty funny if you know that 301 is a redirect, and it's like, yeah. It's not an error. It means go over there. Anyway, I've eventually figured this out. Um, and this thing gets to work without the cooperation of the mirror maintainers. And so it uh, very quickly was able to provide much better service to the users of Debian. And that's because synchronized action comes at a cost. If the cdn.debian.net people need everyone else to change, not every everyone else, but someone else, some, some set of people, to change their config files on their mirror servers, uh, there's two costs here. One is the sort of obvious cost that they have to send a lot of emails. But maybe they figured that out and they like chose this strategy knowing full well that they would be sending a lot of emails. The other is kind of a cap on the amount of good that the service can do. So if, if we think that saving, that speeding up Debian package downloads can save 10 million, uh, let's say can save 1 million person hours per year uh, among Debian users, um, it'll only start to deliver those benefits when all the people they need to synchronize with have actually taken the action they need. So if you say that mirror operators will take six months or so to respond to this email and actually change their config files, it means that half of the possible good that could have come to the community is wasted, waiting on people to take actions that they don't care about. So I think there's a, it's not just the cost of doing the communication, it's there's the cost of delay also. Uh, in economics, they call this the future discount of money, I think. Um, so uh, if you're David Eves, though, uh, you will term these collaboration versus cooperation. So David likes to draw this attention to this idea that cooperation is when I'm doing something that builds on top of someone else's work. I don't need their approval to be improving their work. It just happens. Uh, collaboration is when people have to get together and really agree on a lot of things before the good result can come. And uh, David Eves kind of blew my mind when I saw a talk from him, and he explained that Wikipedia is not a collaborative project. It's a cooperative project. There's not a huge amount of crossover between editors of different articles. It's like people are writing an article, 
and in sum is pretty powerful. And that's actually very analogous to Debian. There's not a lot of cross, there's no crossover between maintainers of mirrors, and there's almost no, there's little crossover between maintainers of packages. So that's my takeaway from the cdn.debian.net story. Uh, eventually, http.debian.net became an official service, so there's a nice happy ending. People figured out how to do it right. Uh, the second story I want to tell you is about web applications in Debian. So uh, hands again, how many people run WordPress somewhere? Cool. And then uh, keep your hands up for a moment. I mean, you need to filter it again. Um, of, of you all, how many do that on an Ubuntu or Debian server somewhere? OK, great. And then of you all, how many have installed WordPress from the apt-get install WordPress Debian package? <laughs> so there's something we're doing wrong in the community about that. Um, and I would say the incentives just aren't aligned for you to get a nice installable package. And let me illuminate that. So in, in economics, I was saying people talk about the marginal cost of an action, the cost of the next action. Uh, and if you already know how to run Apache or Nginx, and you already have a server somewhere, and you already know how to find a WordPress website, following their instructions to install it is not that complicated. When you're making a choice for yourself, at the margin, you'll install WordPress the way they say to. That's fine. Uh, by contrast, there's stuff in Debian that is harder to install, harder to build from source, like LibreOffice. That takes like two days. And you probably wouldn't do that yourself. You'd probably rely on the Debian packages. Uh, for you, the users of Debian, it's not clear that we're providing value that's greater than the cost to you of doing it yourself. Uh, if you didn't know how to run a server, then maybe this would be helpful. Um, so I'll take a bit of this brief detour by talking about why I maintain the Alpine package. So Alpine, how many of you have used Pine, actually? Yeah, OK, cool. So Alpine, released in 2006, is the new, as of then, open source build of Pine. And when I saw this announcement, I was like, this is my calling. <laughs> I have been using Pine at that point for like seven years, maybe like six years. And it was like such a huge part of my life. And I really was excited that it was open source and I could distribute it to all the Debian users who wanted to install an open source build of Pine. Uh, and so I was like, great, I will be so helpful to the Debian world. Uh, but the reason that I did it wasn't just to be helpful. I actually succeeded at doing it and then I waited for some people to review my work. Uh, but while I was waiting, I could still use the Alpine package. I had like four computers, and I was the sysadmin at the computer club, so I could install the package there. I gave everyone their Alpine, uh, even before Debian had approved my thing. Um, I was incentivized to make this package because it helped me do a thing I already wanted to do in the first place, which was run Alpine and easily install it. It was only a tiny amount of extra marginal work to show that to somebody else, and then they would give me review feedback, and I'd be like, wow, Unix is fascinating. I should fix that. And I would learn something. And I was in college. You probably believe that I wanted to learn things. Um, so uh, I was able to help myself by making the Alpine package, and contributing it to Debian was just a tiny delta on top of that. Um, and it was worth the emotional benefit that I got, and I paid only a small cost for it, really, because I, I already wanted a deb file. Uh, and I think that. If you're wondering why Debian developers don't package more web apps, it's because we're not altruists. Uh, for example, I claim that I like Alpine. I claim I want people to use Alpine. But here is a long list of things I haven't done. I don't maintain the Fedora package. Uh, I don't maintain the Macports package. I only infrequently answer people's questions on the mailing list. Uh, like Those things don't help me. And so I kind of didn't think to do them much. Uh, I did join the mailing list because sometimes people ask me questions there. Uh, I ask questions there. Sometimes I want to ask questions. I just want to learn more about Alpine. And so it's fun to answer people's questions periodically. But um, I'm clearly not an altruist who is, mo who is motivated by the joy and the good of promoting Alpine for all the world. Uh, and that brings me to the incentives for packaging web apps for Debian developers. So in 2009, I moved into a new house in Boston and Somerville. If for those who know the difference, great. Uh, <laughs> great. And uh, my house eventually became known as November. And we needed a, I decided we needed a wiki to collaborate on. And so I installed MediaWiki on my server. And then we had a wiki. Uh, exactly. Um, like you do, totally. Um, and I realized when prepping this talk, it never occurred to me that I should co-maintain the MediaWiki package for Debian. But I'm a Debian developer. I'm doing something. But the thing is that. 
the Debian packaging for web apps is so different from untar some PHP somewhere and edit some configuration files that are located right next to the PHP and hard code all sorts of facts about your server and then hard code that into your Apache config file. Um, you know other people are going to want to use Nginx and you probably would want to make it flexible to them. Like, it just didn't seem like a related activity and so I didn't do it. Uh, so when you find that Debian developers look altruistic, I think you're sort of misled by the, the presence of these positive externalities. So externalities is this economic concept where if like uh, Philip and I are making a deal about pens and somehow this results in something good in Alana's life, uh, that's an externality. Like Philip and I aren't negotiating about our pen prices in order to help out Alana. Uh, it's external to the economic action that's taking place. Uh, in free and open source software, there's a lot of distributing software. Uh, distributing software comes at basically zero cost. So it's going to look like I care about a lot of people, but it's just externalities. Like you install Alpine and like that's cool. I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. Um, for the same reason that I'm not the Fedora maintainer. Like <laughs> luckily somebody else is. Um, but I would only really make the package then if the value to me was greater than the cost for me to do it. And value can be defined in a number of ways. It can be emotional value. Uh, it can be educational value. Um, but it does matter if those two aren't really related activities, installing a thing and making the package for the thing, like they kind of aren't in Debian for web apps, then you'll never get this. Uh, and it's kind of tragic because there are a lot of great open source web apps. Uh, there's EtherCalc for online spreadsheets. There's Etherpad for online collaborative text documents. Of course, there's WordPress. Uh, that is packaged, thankfully. Um, there's Lime Survey for making surveys like SurveyMonkey. Uh, I made this using a tool called Hacker Slides. Um, you're never going to get those in Debian because the incentives aren't aligned. Uh, only when, I think, only when installing something, installing a web app is almost the same as packaging that app, is it then are you then going to see a lot of web app packages in Debian? As a, as a side note, as a self-serving addendum to this, I guess I'll say, uh, I now work on an open source project called Sandstorm, where we do align these incentives well, and we do, I think, make installing something uh, comparable to making a package of the thing. So uh, we have an install fest at 6 p.m. tonight in the Hacker Lounge. I'll save it again at the end. You'll never get these out of Debian, though. And I, I know this. I spent a bunch of time la at last year's Debian conference organizing a Birds of a Feather session on web app packaging. And we came up with a long list of problems. And then we looked around and we're like, who's going to solve them? Uh, and the closest answers we got were like, Russ Albury is like, I could, I could solve some of these, but I now work at Dropbox on not our public web apps, so I'm probably not going to. But I could help you get these answers into policy. But that policy isn't going to help if no one is incentivized to take the actions. So that's why you don't get web apps in Debian, sorry. Uh, my final story is about Debian's efforts in reproducible builds. So this is a happier story. Um, the idea of binary reproducible builds is that, so when you app get something, maybe it was slow to compile, I said, like LibreOffice. Um, and so we compiled it for you on the Debian build servers. And uh, hopefully, we compiled it right. Hopefully, we didn't compile it maliciously. You might want to check that. Um, it's especially subtle because under some circumstances, the binaries that you get in Debian are literally the binaries developed, compiled on the Debian developer's own machine, not even on the Debian build servers. So <laughs> we're working on it. It's, it's almost fixed. It's almost fixed. It uh, really is. Um, but, but you might want to verify it <laughs> anyway. Uh, so great, this is easy, right? We, have, we publish the source code. We promise that every Debian package will build from source. That's part of what it means to be a good Debian package, and it's required by policy. So you could just rebuild it yourself. And what you would find is that most programs don't compile the same way when you compile them. <laughs> you would have got them slightly different bits. Uh, and I was talking with my friend Lunar about this two years ago at this Debian conference in Switzerland. And Lunar was telling me, so he has professionally worked on Tor, the anonymity-oriented internet routing system. Uh, he really cares about security and enabling people to not have malicious software, even if it's open source. Um, 
And he was saying, Debian could be the shiny example. We could be the ones to set the tone for the open source distributions world, and we could distribute binary reproducible packages so that anyone could run this script and verify that these inputs really do generate that output. Um, and it would be really impressive, and it would be especially impressive because this was summer 2013. This was about two months after Edward Snowden's leaks went public. And so it was especially urgent to all of us, doubly so because Edward Snowden literally tells people to use Tails, which is a Debian derivative, which uh, he recommends for using browsing the web anonymously in an operating system that's bundles Tor. So it would be pretty cool if Tails were binary reproducible and people could verify that Tails really is the bits that people think it is. Uh, but he also knew that there's 1,000 plus Debian developers. There's 58,000 binary packages. Um, he knows how hard it is to get people to all agree to spend their time on something. And you've seen with cdn.debian.net that it's not always tractable. Uh, so he was sort of telling me all these problems. And I was like, look, Lunar, it's not as bad as you think, although there are a bunch of technical problems. And one that we both knew about is that compressed files with gzip like uh, if you look at a readme file, compressed files with gzip contain the time that they were compressed. And so if you have a package that contains a gzip file and you try to rebuild it, perhaps the only thing different is that you compress it at a different time. But the checksum will be different, and now you have to go research what the heck is different. Maybe there's something subtle and horrible that went on. Uh, but what I told him was the Debian team, the Debian world as a whole, doesn't care about binary reproducible builds. A tiny fraction of them do. Um, your job is to identify the people who actually do care and get them to identify the problems like this, where the specific issues that prevent builds from occurring the same way a second time. Uh, start by documenting those. And then maybe you can create a convincing demo. And then if you make a great demo, you can show people that it's not quite as hard as they thought. OK. So we get 30 people together at the Debian conference because he just like, excited now, wanders around telling everyone he knows to come to this birds of a feather session. And they do. And uh, we figure out that researching what ways builds aren't binary reproducible is a task that people can do in parallel. Uh, this is now sounds like cooperation, not collaboration. Uh, this is just the research phase first. Um, also, um, within a few months, I got a new job at Eventbrite, and then I totally fell off the face of the earth. Uh, luckily, Lunar pushed forward on this. Um, he figured out that there are just a few layers where if you modify them in Debian, they're used by almost every Debian package, and every Debian maintainer takes them for granted. If you modify these three packages, dpackage, debhelper, and binutils, you can get 62% of Debian packages to rebuild identically. Uh, the first two are Debian tools, and the third one is a GNU tool. Um, those things were adding non-reproducibility to Debian packages. So you fix three packages, and all the rest of the archive suddenly is reproducible. Um, this is a real contrast from the Debian discussions about this before, where we had opined about this in the mailing list in 2007, and people said things like, I can see no benefit from binary reproducible builds. Uh, that's a statement that means this person will never take any action. So if we want this project to succeed, we need to have it work where this person doesn't take any action. It can still work. Uh, and other people say it's technically infeasible. Lunar showed that it's probably technically feasible. Um, but we can see that basically people, Debian developers, don't care that much. So, uh, so the other thing that drove us over the past two years is a more recent discovery that uh, the intelligence community has been trying hard to, has been researching how to backdoor Xcode by Apple so that people's iOS apps will leak all of their secrets to the NSA. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a the, there's an abstract of a paper they gave at a conference in 2012 that was leaked by Edward Snowden. Um, you can read about it in this PDF of screen caps of the NSA's internal wiki, which is this fascinating concept. Um, <laughs> but, um, but what we find is that fixing just a few packages has this massive follow-on impact. Here, uh, a few weeks ago, Lunar and Holger and the rest of the team fixed five build tools. And then these 32 packages, maintained by people who probably don't care about reproducible builds, suddenly were reproducible. So uh, there's now 80% now plus of the archive is binary reproducible. Binary reproducible um, 
I told Lunar there will be about 12, 12 or 10, 20 types of issues. You'll find those, you'll fix them in the underlying tools, and then they'll get fixed. And then I like wandered off and didn't help at all. And uh, <laughs> I was wrong. There are currently known to be 132 specific non-reproducibility issues. So it is a bit bigger than I thought. The team has put in a huge amount of work, but the people who actually cared could put in that work, and as they figured out what small number of intermediate Debian packaging tools needed to change, they only needed to convince the maintainers of those, and they demonstrated that the value to Debian of doing this is higher than anyone thought. No one thought, I think, that no one in Debian realistically thought that 62% of the archive could become rebuildable by fixing three packages. So uh, we demonstrated the value is high, and we limited the number of people who have to pay this cost. And so the way I would summarize this is that Lunar set direction for the project by changing what is easy, what is easily achieved by the people who are doing the work. So I have just a few minutes left. Uh, I'll leave you with my takeaways and then offer a few cliche questions. So uh, these are the three things that I think are worth knowing about Debian and I think really basically all open source volunteer communities. Um, I promised in the talk proposal that I would explain how these concepts relate to some questions that everyone loves to ask, like, where are the designers in open source? Where are the documentation writers in open source? But uh, if we know that people don't act out of altruism, then we need to find people whose motivations align with the actions we want them to take. Um, getting core project documentation might be really hard, but getting people to write blog posts about how to do things might be really easy. Getting people to write lists of collections of blog posts might be really easy too, because that would be useful to them. Um, and the question about designers is this other fascinating uh, sample bias problem where if basically, having only a few seconds, I'll say in a very coarse-grained way, if you write software that nobody who cares about design wants to use, then their lives aren't going to get noticeably better by improving the design of it, because they've already picked something else. Uh, the best you can hope for is that people, is that if you want to help designers improve that software, you'll need to find some motivation other than I'm fixing the software that I'm using. And maybe that motivation is I want to make an impact, and then you had better make sure they can make an impact. So maybe you had better pair a mentor with them, and they like the designer talks with them, the designer uh, is invisible to the world, and this developer in the project just like submits patches. There's no design discussion, there's just patches. And then like the project will get better, the designer will be happy they have impact, they can blog about it, they can add to their portfolio. Uh, the person who is taking the actions that can improve the project is empowered to do that. Uh, so thanks, I know it is 45 past. I'm happy to take some more questions. Um, there is an install fest for Sandstorm, which is kind of what Debian would have been like had it emerged in a webby world in the 90s uh, at 6 p.m. Um, yeah, so you can tweet at me here and talk with me here. Thanks so much. <laughs>